In this video, we want to talk about leasing. What exactly what is leasing? I'm sure we're all aware of what a lease is. We've all rented something. But from a business perspective, leasing is a form of financing. You're acquiring an asset and you're making payments in some sort. So let's work our way through and see what what topics we want to talk about here. There's different kinds of leases. There's tax treatment that we have to worry about. How does it affect financial statements? Then we're going to look at how the leasee analyzes it and how the lessor analyzes it. And of course, there are always a couple other questions at the end for us to consider whether or not a lease makes sense for us. So who are the two parties to a lease? The lessee is the one that uses the assets. They're going to make payment for the use of that asset. The lessor actually owns the asset and they get the rental payments. So the lease decision, again, as we're mentioning, is really a financing question for the lessee and an investment decision for the lessor. There are four primary types of leases. An operating lease, typically a very short time, typically they're cancelable, and maintenance is usually included in the lease agreement. A finance lease, though, is a long-term lease. Normally it's non-cancelable, and maintenance is usually not included. There are also two other types. One is really just a combination of the above. But there is something called a sale and lease back. This is an arrangement where a company owns an asset. And for some reason, let's just say they need cash. So what they will do is they will sell this asset to a company and that company will then lease it back to them. So they own an asset, they sell it, and then they lease the asset back. What do they get? They get cash, they get maybe maintenance, right? They get some other benefits from it. And of course, the person who's buying this and then leasing it back, they would only do that if they were ultimately going to make some kind of money and profit on the deal. So how are taxes impacted here? Well, leases are, tax are classified by the IRS as either being a tax-oriented lease or a non-tax-oriented lease. A, in a tax-oriented lease, the lessor is treated as the owner and that entire lease payment is deductible by the lessee. If it's a non-tax oriented lease, the lessee is treated as the owner. They can claim depreciation, they have to pay for maintenance, and but they can only deduct the interest, they call this the imputed interest payment. The effective interest payment on the lease payment, not the whole lease payment. So it is important in how we're going to classify the actual lease itself. So how does leasing affect the firm's balance sheet? For accounting purposes, leases are classified as either a capital or an operating lease. Capital operating leases longer than a year have to be shown on the lessee's balance sheet by capitalizing the lease. So what does that mean? We're going to calculate the present value of the lease payments at the lessee's cost of debt, and that value is going to be reported as a lease liability. It has the right of use asset. What does that, what impact does it have on the firm's capital structure? So again, let's kind of go back just for a second. So what does this look like on the balance sheet? 
if you're the lessee, if you are, uh, uh, if this is considered a, an operating lease, then the asset does not show up on your uh, balance sheet as an asset. You have an expense. But if it's a capital lease, it's going to show up as a right of asset. It's going to show up as an asset on your um, balance sheet. Now, on the financing side, a lease is just a substitute for debt. So it's going to use up some of the firm's debt capacity. So if you have a 50-50 target capital structure, if half of your assets are leased, how should the remaining assets be financed? Technically, right, if the assets are leased and you have 50-50, Half of your assets, that's your debt. So the other 50% would all be financed with equity. So again, how does this show up on, again, we're looking at the balance sheet here. The, if, if the lessee, if this is an operating lease, this shows up as a liability. That you have to make payment on this uh, uh, debt, on this, on this lease. But if it's a capital lease, and you own the asset, so it shows up on the left-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, it might not show up in the balance sheet because this liability is made with payments from the actual, um, from the lease itself. On the income statement, the lessee shows this lease payment as an expense, on the lessor, they show it as revenue. So how this impacts balance sheets is very important. Um, creditors want to know what is your real, your actual debt liability. They want to know if there are, historically this has been referred to as off balance sheet financing. Because in certain instances, right, if this is a uh, an operating lease, it doesn't show up as a debt. It shows up in the footnotes as a line item or as a as an explanation of the expenses in on the lease side. So, let's assume that this company wants to uh, acquire some new equipment. It has a six-year useful life. If the equipment is leased, they can obtain a four-year lease that includes maintenance. The lease meets the IRS guidelines so they could expense the lease payments. And that rental payment would be $260,000 at the beginning of each year. For the, le for the lease itself, for the person who's buying this asset, they're going to buy the asset for a million dollars. The loan rate is 10%. Their tax rate's 25%. It has a three-year maker's life. If the company borrows and buys four-year maintenance contract, if they buy the actual contract, it'd be, they'd have to pay 20000 at the beginning of each year. And at the end of this year, the lessor has a residual value in this asset of $200,000. So let's think about the tax shield, the depreciation tax shield. In year one, you bought this asset for a million dollars. That means you're gonna be able to deduct $333,300 as an expense and that's going to reduce your taxes by $83,325. So that should be an inflow for you. So let's look at the present value of, of, of this loan, of owning this asset. So the loan payment every year, we're going to make $75,000,000. At the end, we'll pay back the loan and the 75,000. The depreciation shield every year, 
111,037, etc. We're going to make the maintenance payment of 20,000. That's going to save us five grand in taxes. We'll have a residual value. And of course, if we sell that, the tax on the residual value would be about $50,000. So the net cash flows, if we bought this asset, we'd pay this negative 15 at times zero. Here's our cash flows moving forward for owning this particular asset. So what if, if we look at the discount rate now of owning, right? Leasing is very similar to this debt financing. The cash flows are gonna have relatively low risk, right? Mostly it's fixed by the contract. So the firm's cost of debt is a really good uh, indicator of what the discount rate should be. So the after-tax discount rate for leasing this asset is 7.5%. So now let's look at what is the present value of owning this asset. If you pay negative 15, here's our cash flows we had before. So the present value of owning this asset, discounted at 7.5%, is negative $724,000. So if you, again, we haven't considered any revenues or anything like that. This is just the cash flows associated with buying and financing this asset. It'd be negative $724,000. So now what's next? Now let's look at what happens if we lease this asset. We're going to pay two sixty dollars a year on this asset. That's going to have a tax saving of... 65,000 a year. And now we have our net cash flows each year for the next four years here. We're going to pay 195,000 is what we'll pay. And again, the present value of leasing is negative 702. So what do we have to figure out? What is the net advantage of leasing? So you take the next 702. That's the cost of leasing. Subtract from that the present value of owning. In this case, that's a negative number. So you subtract it, that's like adding a number. So the net advantage of leasing this asset is $22,000. And if you just look at the two numbers, it's $22,000 cheaper to lease the asset than it is to buy the asset most companies do a fair amount of leasing for lots of reasons. This one isn't always it, right? Sometimes we'll do it just because of convenience. Sometimes we might do it uh, because it's very short term and we just want to do something quick and get, uh, get uh, kind of in and out of this deal and then move forward. So at the end, we saw what this asset is going to have a value at the end. This has a residual value. How does that affect this decision? Well, the lessor owns the equipment, right? So they get the, uh, this uh, uh, belongs to them essentially when the lease expires. So the risk of this is going to be passed from the lessee to the lessor. I'm using the asset, and at the end, the lessor gets it back. So that risk, the risk of that value falls on the person who has that value, which is at the end. So again, this residual value risk makes the lease more attractive to the lessee. What are you going to do with this asset when it's done? What is it going to be worth? The more the variability, the more risk there is. And of course, the lessee doesn't want that. So how should the lessor analyze this transaction, right? This to them, remember, is an investment. So we have to look at the cash flows that we expect to receive. And don't forget, we bought this asset. So all those combined uh, cash flows need to be considered to try to figure out whether this is a good or a bad idea for me to go through with the transaction. 
So let's assume, in this case, that the lease payment is 280000 instead of that two sixty. Everything else in this example is the same. So here are all the cash flows. We're going to buy this asset for a million dollars. Remember that? We had a depreciation shield. We had to pay for maintenance. There's a tax savings on that. Now here's where I received some lease payments. Of course, that's revenue, so I have to pay taxes. I own the asset, at the end is 200,000. That means there's a tax on that residual value when I liquidate the asset. What are the cash flows? I have a net cash, negative cash flow, negative 805. And then I have these four cash flows following the purchase of this asset. So what does this tell us? The net present value of those cash flows is seven at seven and a half percent is thirty one thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars. The internal rate of return on this investment nine point four percent. Should the lessor write this lease? Well the net present value is 31000 It's positive, so they should. And of course, since we have a net present value that's positive, we also know that the internal rate of return is greater than the discounted uh, the discount rate. So we're going to make profit on this transaction. So again, we would say the lessor should make this transaction it is beneficial to them. The lessee should make this lease work because the cost to them of leasing is less than the cost of owning. If the lessor changes the lease payment, what happens? And of course, you know, if they receive less cash, obviously it goes down, the net present value goes down, and now it turns out that the, um, the uh, decision to buy this asset was a bad decision. So the lessor has to determine what is the mac, excuse me, what is the minimum lease payment I can make first to break even. So whatever that number is, we know it's somewhere between two hundred and sixty and two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Once we know what the break even point is, we can now say, well, does this is it possible for me to make money? So again, if we said that this number is two hundred and seventy thousand is the break even, we know that's the minimum we want to charge. But the question then is, am I going to make any money at that point, right? At the break-even point where both sides get, uh, get exactly what they want here, or, or we get to zero here for the, the benefit to the lessor, what that's going to tell me is I don't make any money. So how much can I charge? That kind of depends on the market. In this case, can the market absorb a $280,000 lease? We probably don't even want to offer that. We might tell them, look, we'll lease this to you for $300,000. They might say, oh, that's, that's too high. But now I happen to know I can't go less than two seventy. dollars So now I can negotiate. I can negotiate this lease understanding what my break-even point is, and then what profit I want to make, what profit I need to make for my investors, and then, if I can, get a little bit extra from the lessee. What happens if the lease has a cancellation clause? Who takes the risk of that? Well, the cancellation clause is a risk to the less uh, to the lessor, because at any time the lessee can can stop it. So how am I going to deal with this if it, if I'm the lessor? 
I'm going to make sure that I'm either going to impose a penalty, right? There could be an early quit kind of a penalty, or I would just increase the annual lease payment to cover that. So in the end, right, the analysis is going to give us an answer as to what we should do or not, right? And, and typically, the analysis tells us that owning is less costly than leasing. But leasing, again, as I mentioned earlier, is very popular. Why? Number one, they may take care of the maintenance expenses. Two, it takes some risk away from the lessee. They don't have to worry about the life of the project, operating risk, residual value. They don't have to worry about any of those things. Now, portfolio risk reduction allows the lessor to better bear these risks, right? They can uh, offer these, what, to more than one company, right? More than one kind of asset. So the lessor can offset some of these risks. So leasing, as we've hopefully have talked about here, leasing is a form of financing. In a perfect world, if the market was in equilibrium, both the lessee and the lessor would break even on this event. They both would get exactly what they wanted. There is some negotiating power that's possible for the lessor but they need to understand the market. They need to understand the assets. They need to be able to account for and deal with all the risks of owning the asset so that they can pass those off, obviously, to the lessee in the form of either cancellation clauses or maybe higher levels of lease payments. So that's all about leasing. Look forward to seeing you again. Take care.